Preston Wood. Good to see you today. Why don't you go ahead and stand together? One glimpse of your glory Nothing in this world can compare oh, 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 Just one day in your presence It's better than a thousand elsewhere Just one glimpse of your glory Nothing in this world gathered in this place today. He says, come into my courts with thanksgiving and praise. Be thankful. The psalmist says to bless your name for the Lord is good and he is worthy of our praise. That's why we've gathered. And he says when we do that, when we bring him a thankful praise, that he inhabits our praise. He dwells in, he delights in our praise. Such a beautiful time in the presence of the Lord today. It's going to be powerful. We're going to look to God's word that is life to us. We're going to celebrate his goodness, celebrate him in song, and uh, we want to welcome you today. If you're our guest today at Prestonwood, we especially want to welcome you. We're so glad that you've chosen to worship with us. We have been praying for you to join us, and we hope you sense the love of God that's in this place for you. There's a Prestonwood Today program you receive, and there's a little tear-off section called a guest registration. We would love for you to fill that out, and just take that to Guest Central as you leave today, right out in the atrium. We have a gift, one of Dr. Graham's books we would love to give you, and we will come alongside you and your family to serve you 
and to love you in any way that we possibly can. We're here to support you. This is a family. And if you're joining us at Prestonwood.live, 42 nations around the world joined us last week to worship with us and to search God's word with us. We're so glad that you're with us. And I especially want to take a moment, a shout out to our service men and women serving all around the world who protect us. Thank you. We know that you're joining us in worship as well. We appreciate you so much. Before we continue in our worship, why don't you find somebody around you, welcome them today, give them a high five. Greet them, we're really glad that you're here. All right, church family, you may go ahead and be seated. We're gonna continue in our worship celebrating changed lives through baptism today. Good morning, church family. We have eight professing their faith through Believer's Baptism this morning. This is William Clark. And this is Christina Lemansky. Christina and William, because of your public profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and in obedience to His command, we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. A couple of sisters. And these are sisters. This is Madison Lamaru. And this is Miley Lamaru. Madison and Miley, because of your public profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and in obedience to his command, we baptize you now, our sisters, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is L. Loon. And this is Angel Pollard. L. and Angel, because of your public profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and obedience to his command, we baptize you, our sisters, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Brother, sister. This is Dawson McClure. And this is Dawson's sister, Shelby McClure. Dawson and Shelby, because of your public profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and obedience to his command, it's our privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in the newness of life. I got you. Well, pastor and church family, we have some incredible little ones and additions to our church that we'd love to introduce to you. Jordan and Jennifer Adams with Jet Cooper. <laughs> Timothy and Caitlin Aguilar with Mila Jade. Dustin and Megan Baylog with Caroline Reese. Greg and Courtney Barentine with Brady Clayton. Adriana and Stephanie Bassani with Gemma Rose. Ambrose and Natalia Brecolo with Milana Brecolo. Eric and JJ Contreras with Clara Vestry Marie. And grandfather is pastor's friend and Texas congressman Roger Williams. Kinsley and Quinta Fonqua with David Williams. John and Anna Kate Hardy with Charlotte Reese. (laughs) 
Charles and Lacey Marja with Evelyn Grace. Keeson and Shannon Martin with Mary Lacey. James and Angel McKee with Owen William. Joseph and Whitney McIntosh with Charles Doyle. <laughs> Paul and Marshall Michael with Quinn Madison. Adam and Lindsay Moore with McKinley June. Mike and Brittany Moreland with Brooklyn Grace. <laughs> Christopher and Cassandra Noel with Candace Kane. Baba Femi and Yimi Oganyanyami with Ola Lua Michael. <laughs> Shondell Sandiford with Aiden Arton. Adam and Ali Swope with Seton McMillan. Kyle and Melody Soltero with Lila Ann. Kyle Soltero is active duty for the U.S. Navy and watching online in Washington. Now, how far would you have driven just to see that and celebrate that? And each one of these are gifts from the Lord, and we are so grateful. You know, the Bible says children are the heritage, the gift from the Lord. And I know that you see this precious child that you're holding in your hands, in your arms, in your hearts, in your homes as truly a gift from God. And we celebrate with you. Uh, you know, church is a family. It should be, and we believe we are a spiritual family and truly a family together. And so that's what families do, is to celebrate together the good times, the great times, as well as to share together some of the sad times. We're, we're family. We're in this together. And so it's very, very uh, appropriate that we take time in our services like this church to, to welcome these families. And uh, these parents, it's really a time of dedication for you. Uh, one day you can tell your children about this dedication, but this is really for you and your commitment to be the godly parent, uh, the Christ, build the Christ-centered home that uh, you desire to build. And we pray that God will use you greatly. I tell you what, um, being a parent, you never stop being a parent, right? All the grandparents, uh, you, you know, it's like the Supreme Court. It's a lifetime appointment <laughs> when you become an, a parent and you'll find that out. Uh, that your parenting never stops. And you have three responsibilities, primarily. One, well, I'm getting the amen chorus going here with these little guys and gals. But we have, uh, we have the responsibility to pray for our children, to pray for their protection, to pray that God will raise them up as a light in the world, to pray for their salvation. Uh, you know, children, baby dedication this time, we pray that one day and one day when they're later in life that they will personally respond and receive Christ as their Savior. But until then, you can pray forward and you can pray for their salvation, that they will grow up strong in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And that's the second thing. We owe them training and development. The church can assist in that. We can come alongside of you in that. But it's your responsibility as parents to teach your children the ways of the Lord and the wisdom of God with God's Word. And I would just really challenge you on that. Again, as a church, we will help you, but that's on you and me as parents that we make sure that our children are nurtured 
and nourished in the Lord. And then one final thing, and that's your example. You owe your children your prayers. You owe them nurturing and training, and you owe them your example because they will follow you as you follow Christ. And dads and moms, this is a big responsibility, and that's why we need prayer. That's why we uh, continue to support you as parents, the ministries of our church. I see Tim Matthews right here. Uh, is our young Mary's minister. We're here to serve you and to help you be the godly man, woman, husband, father, mom, and wife that God has called you to be. So let's pray together and let's dedicate these to the Lord. We thank you, O oh Lord, for this very special time. And we know these parents will remember this all the days of their lives. And we thank you that they have the confidence and the trust in you to bring their children before you and before your church. We thank you for these grandparents and family members who join alongside of them. We thank you for a church that believes in ministry to children. And we pray that these boys and girls will grow up strong in faith, that they will learn to love you and follow you. May these parents set the pace and give the example that is needed so that these children will truly be a light in this world. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, parents. Let's give them a hand. And boys and girls, great to meet you, all of you. So beautiful to celebrate with these families today. In Philippians, the writer says, Therefore God hath highly exalted him and given him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord of all. We gather in his name, we're forgiven by his name, we worship in his name. It's all because of the great name of Jesus that we worship today. Let's continue to celebrate.
lift that up. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. You may be seated. So good to come together with the family of God and just to declare his truth in this place today. And just to say thank you, Lord, for your goodness and mercy. Thank you that you forgive me of my sin and you give me hope for eternity. It's a beautiful time in the presence of the Lord today. As we continue in our time of worship, our ushers are going to be preparing to wait upon us. You know, our worship is far more than a song, isn't it? It's the totality of our lives offered back to him as our worship. Not just our words, but giving him our time, our talent, our resources, everything offered back as a sacrifice to say, thank you for what you have done for me. You are the center of all things. I am not the center. So as we give in our worship today, we present our offerings as a thank you and say it's all yours to begin with. You're the giver of good gifts and that's why we worship through our giving. It's far more than a song. And we're going to teach you a new song here in a moment and um, I was watching all those babies up here being dedicated and I've got three babies but one of them six foot five and uh, one of them just starting to drive as a 16-year-old girl, and, and then I got a fifth grader, and I'm thinking how fast time goes, right? I mean, uh, any, any moms and dads, grandpas and grandmas in the room say, this thing is moving quick, right? We need to seize the moments, seize the moments. And I remember as a child, every time I would walk in the front door of my house, uh, my parents had a plaque on the wall, and it's from Joshua. It says, as for me and my house, we will what? We will serve the Lord serve the Lord. And uh, we were talking about that as a team, and we were saying, we have got to put songs on the hearts of our people that our, our mothers and fathers can sing over their homes, a declaration over their homes. And uh, this house will be a house full of love and forgiveness and mercy and grace, and God's presence will be here, and it will be full of God's word where faith will be built up. This house will be a house of praise. We started ruminating on that and singing to the Lord. And the song we're going to teach you today came out of that time. And I think it's also a wonderful declaration for us, this house that we dedicate as a house of worship unto the Lord, that we would continually say, as the psalmist said, praise awaits you in this place. This is your house. Your name will be lifted high. Your word will be exalted. And that is why we're here today. So as the ushers prepare to wait upon us, I'm going to pray. And then we're going to declare it in this place. Father, we thank you for your presence with us already. We know that you are going to teach us and transform us by the power of your word today. And we once again say these offerings, both in song, in our treasures, in our time, we offer them to you and say thank you, Lord. And once again, we declare that this house is yours and yours alone. You are the center of all things. And we praise your name. In the name that is above every name, the beautiful name, the powerful name of Jesus, we pray and we worship, and everybody said, amen. Jesus Christ. 
Good morning, everyone. Let me invite you to take God's Word and turn to the letter to the Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, chapter 2. This is our series called Going the Distance. That's the theme of this letter to the Hebrews. It's a letter to you as a believer and follower of Jesus, that you would persevere in your life and in your faith, that you would run with endurance the race that is set before you, that you would not only start the race, but that you would finish the race and finish it well. Now, if we're going to persevere in life and in our Christian faith, then it requires a muscular faith. So we're talking about developing a muscular faith, a strong, vibrant faith. That's what this is all about, to live a life that stays on purpose, and stays on course without wavering, never drifting. And the title of my message today is The Danger of Drifting. I might even add the deadly danger of drifting. Look at the first four verses of Hebrews 2. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, the message declared by angels, delivered by angels, is the law, the Ten Commandments. And we know that's reliable, the Ten Commandments given by God. And every transgression or disobedient received is a just retribution. That is, we are judged by the law when we break the law. We are not really breaking the law. We are broken by the breaking of the law. But then look at verse 3. This is an unanswerable question. It is a question that preachers cannot answer, philosophers cannot answer, scientists cannot answer, politicians cannot answer. It is a question that is unanswerable. How shall we escape if we neglect or ignore such a great salvation. It was declared at first by the Lord, that is Jesus proclaimed it, he announced it, and it was attested to us, the apostles, who believed it and advanced it. And while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by the gifts of the power of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. If anyone ever says to you, you can't find the Trinity in the Bible, where's the Trinity? You just saw it. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, right here in this brief breath of Scripture. Yes, God is Father, God is Son, God is Holy Spirit. And God gave us his word, God gave us his Son. Jesus announced this salvation. He was the greatest proclaimer of his own message and salvation who ever lived. God had one son and he made him a preacher, Jesus. He came preaching the gospel. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. It's all him. And then the Holy Spirit who empowers this message through the works of the apostle and the witness that is attested here. In in the first chapter, the first couple of messages in this series, We saw the superiority and the supremacy of Christ. That he is the creator, the sustainer, the redeemer, and the savior of all who believe. And therefore, the writer says, therefore, because this is true, because of the superiority of Jesus Christ, you must not neglect this salvation. You must not drift away. You must not go back into your old way of life. That's what he's saying. Therefore, because this is true, if you really believe that Jesus is who he says he is and what the Bible claims him to be, how can you drift? How can you ignore or neglect this salvation? There are some who reject Jesus and salvation. Unbelievers But there are those who neglect it and 
This is addressed to Christians. How will we as believers escape if we neglect so great a salvation. It's possible to drift away and to be shipwrecked. Obviously, this is a mariner's term, a sailor's word. This drift away. When I was in West Palm Beach, Florida in the 1980s, the guys down there would often tell me, if you'll go out with us into the Atlantic Ocean and into the Gulf Stream of the Atlantic Ocean, which is, ba is a river that runs through uh, the Atlantic seaboard there, said, guaranteed, we will catch a sailfish. Sailfish capital of the world. So two or three times I went. Every time we began to drift out there in that sea. And the more we drifted, the sicker I got. Never caught a sailfish, never saw a sailfish, but I did feed the fish quite a bit. <laughs> because drifting in the ocean will make you sick, guaranteed. And drifting in the ocean of life, in your journey of life, will also be a disaster. Now, it can happen in a number of ways. You know, this idea of drifting, it can happen uh, to a business. For example, Blockbuster, blockbuster business until while they made the transition from VHS to DVDs, they were unable to advance beyond that and they didn't factor in Netflix and YouTube. So when's the last time you went to a blockbuster to rent a movie? They lost their vision, lost their mission. They just sort of drifted. They didn't take care uh, of the business. It, it can happen to an athlete. It can happen to an athletic team. When that team loses its, its determination, loses its discipline, loses its direction, and before you know it, you're perpetually eight and eight. It can happen with our technology. We spend a lot of time with technology and I enjoy the technology that we have, our screens and all the rest. But you know, of course, that these things can become huge diversions and distractions in your life. And you can just sort of drift mindlessly through your day, checking social media, hanging out with your friends on Facebook and the like. I have a new app on my phone that actually monitors your screen time. It will tell you how many minutes, how many hours that you have spent in a week on your screen or on a day on your screen. And it might be shocking to you to see how much time you're spending gazing mindlessly, meandering through your days, wasting time, wasting hours, staring at a screen. And for what? Mindless media obsessions. It's addiction. And as one of my friends says, this thing, picking up his phone, is sucking my brain out. And it's true. And so we need to discipline ourselves in the way we use our technology, lest we're just drifting, just drifting. On a personal level, this drifting can take place. Many of us begin our diets and a new exercise program with dedication and desire. But the first time they pass the big cake and the ice cream, you went back into your old habits, it got tough again, and we gradually drift away back into our old habits, back into our bad habits. We drifted. It can happen in a marriage. Sure it can. You promise one another to love and to live together in marriage as long as you both shall live. But some say, I'm just not feeling it anymore. And so you're looking for other options. It didn't happen overnight. What happened is you didn't nurture your relationship. You didn't pay attention to it. The writer of Hebrews says, pay attention to what we've heard, lest you drift. And if you don't pay attention to your family, if you don't pay attention to your husband, your wife, before you know it, you're drifting apart and more and more your marriage is moving in the wrong direction it can happen in your personal life the decisions you make 
You know, most people don't get up one day and think, you know, I'm going to destroy my life, my character, my reputation. I'm going to do this explosive, terrible thing. It's going to happen today. Rarely if it ever happens. What happens is subtle, insidious, a step at a time, a little bit at a time. We been, begin with small compromises and choices that compromise our character. And big moral earthquakes and disasters typically don't happen overnight. It's, a, it's, like, it's not like a blowout on a tire. It's more like a slow leak. And it really happens when we begin to drift mentally and drift spiritually. No wonder the scripture says that this is a dangerous thing. You're just slip sliding away. And by the way, this word drift can also mean to slip. Like it was used of a ring slipping off the hand or an idea slipping out of your mind. Just letting these things slip, slide away. There's an Old Testament word that the old timers used to speak about. We don't hear it so much today. It's the word backsliding. But it's a good biblical word and it's the whole idea of backpedaling. Of course you can't you can't continue to stay the course in your faith and in your Christian life unless you're moving forward, onward and upward. It's, it, it's like pedaling a bike. You're either going forward or you're falling over. And this idea of slip sliding away, of backing away, of drifting away, you know, it just happens a step at a time. A slip at a time. This decision that doesn't please God and that decision that dishonors God, just, just drifting, just backing up and backing up and backing up. And before you know it, you're far away from God living in the darkness. That's why the scripture says, pay attention. Pay attention to the things that matter the most, your faith, this great salvation. So how are we going to do that? One, there is a clear exhortation here. A clear exhortation. This is a warning passage. There are five of them in the book of Hebrews. Some people don't like the book of Hebrews because these warnings come. But these warnings are like alerts. It's like a news alert. And five times in Hebrews as we make our way through this, we're going to get these warnings, these alerts. And this one is an alert regarding this problem of drifting. Again, it's it's a mariner's term. In the ancient days, of course, a ship would pull up anchor and cast away and go into the seas. It's important that they have a direction, a clear direction, because there were storms at sea and there were winds and currents and, and sea monsters. Just ask Jonah about that one. And many deadly dangers. But we're reading here in scriptures that the most deadly danger of all is the danger of drifting. Because if a ship is drifting, before you know it, it hits an iceberg and sinks. Or it slips away from course and, and runs into disastrous enemies and all the rest. Because if you're just drifting, if you're just floating, you know, like you're floating in your pool, then you find yourself floating right by, drifting right by the safe harbor. Your life, my life, is never to be aimless. God is calling us to meaningful directions, not just floating away. And with that is a compelling affirmation. Because the key word in this passage, if you don't want to drift, is salvation. You see it right in the middle of this passage. How will we escape? How will we survive if we neglect this great salvation? If you are a follower of Jesus, you know that salvation does not come from your human achievement, your efforts, your performance but by the grace of God, the gift of God. What is the gospel? 
that was announced by Jesus, that was advanced by the apostles, that was attested to by the Holy Spirit with these signs and wonders and miracles. It's the gospel of salvation. It's the gospel of the cross and the resurrection. So here's a news alert. It's a good news alert. You're not saved by keeping commandments, achieving personal goals, bonifying your behavior. You are saved by the grace alone in Christ alone through faith alone. That's why this salvation is so great. If salvation is up to me, that's not great. Because I'm not good enough, I'm not great enough to save myself, and neither are you. The reason it's great is because of the great price that Jesus paid for your salvation on the cross, the precious blood of Jesus. It's a great salvation because he gives it to us free and clear when we receive him as Lord and Savior. And that's the attestation. That is the affirmation. So in view of that, how can we neglect that? If you're a believer, how can you ignore that? Some are substituting neglect for reject. I mean, truly, you're not a believer. You have rejected, maybe not overtly so, but you're just not a believer. You have rejected salvation. How will you escape if you reject this salvation? There's no other hope. Nothing but despair, nothing but judgment and hell. You say, you one of those preachers that believe in hell? Absolutely, Jesus believed in hell and told us that there is a hell and there is a judgment. We'll read later on in the book of Hebrews, it is appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. So yes, there is a hell. And to reject the gospel of Jesus Christ is to reject your last and final hope. There is no hope apart from him. But if you are a Christian, as these were Christians Noted in Hebrews chapter 2, then how will you escape? How will you survive? How will you then live if you neglect this salvation, if you ignore it? You began as a sincere Christian. You, You were committed. You were dedicated. You were all in. I have decided to follow Jesus. But now... Gradually, over time, you've drifted. You stopped reading your Bible regularly and faithfully. You used to pray a lot. But now you really, you can't remember the last time you really prayed unless it was emergency SOS. You used to attend church faithfully and regularly. You're here today, or maybe you're watching online, watching on television. But you used to be really faithful to your church. You served, but you started drifting. It wasn't a big decision. It was just, you began treating this whole thing casually. When it comes to church, you're pretty much in and out when you feel like it. You're a drifter. You're a spiritual drifter. How will you escape? How are you going to live? How are you going to survive if you're drifting through life? You used to be a faithful witness for Christ. Your testimony was strong and true and vibrant. People knew you were a believer. But then you began to compromise here and there in choices. Again, you didn't do it deliberately. It was just a drift. And now... Your friends barely know if you're a Christian or not. You see what we're saying here? It's possible to be a believer and follower of Jesus and ultimately be outside 
Not losing your salvation. You can't lose your salvation, but you can sure lose your testimony, and you can sure lose your reputation, and you can sure lose your family. You can lose a lot of things. Not because of some big dynamic decision. Nobody wakes up, rarely does anybody wake up and say, you know, I've decided today to be an atheist. No, it happens over time when you stop believing God and you begin to drift and then you're in deep waters and you have no faith at all. It's a sad situation, isn't it? It's a clear exhortation, a clear warning. It's a compelling affirmation. But in the midst of all of this, you can get things turned around. Life is too short to drift. Billy Graham put it this way. If you went for a walk in the woods but then decided to wander off the path and found yourself surrounded by a thicket of thorns and poison ivy, who would be to blame? Would you blame the person who built the path? No, of course not. Instead, you'd blame yourself if you were honest because you alone were responsible for wandering from the path. In a far deeper way, this is what happens when we decide to leave God out of our lives. For a time, it may seem like wandering away from Him doesn't make any difference. It may even seem easier and freer, but eventually it catches up with us, just as wandering off that path and into the thicket caught up with you. And it's true. I have a little acrostic for you to help you take away some truths, some practical ideas as to how we keep from drifting in our spiritual lives. Number one, D, determine, determine your priorities in life. Determine your priorities in life. Determine what is my purpose in life. I am really glad that as a teenage boy, God called me to the ministry and I made a decision about the direction of my life as a young man. Now that's just my story. It's not everybody's story, of course, and I don't set myself up here is a perfect example, but I'm just telling you, I'm grateful that the course of my life was set as a young man, as I began to get serious about my Christian faith and walk. And so I began, rather than drifting through those college years and 20-something years, had a purpose, had a plan, began to live by priorities in my life, and even though some winds blew and some heavy winds blew in those years in our life. But I stayed on course because I had determined God's purpose, God's plan for my life, and therefore I live by those priorities. That's number one. That will keep you from drifting. Seek first, Matthew 6, the kingdom of God and His righteousness. All of these things will be added unto you. Secondly, renew your faith daily. Renew your faith daily. I believe there is a success habit in the lives of every dynamic believer that I've ever known. And that is this. Give the first moments and minutes of your day to God. How you begin your day sets the mindset of your day and often the direction of your day. And so it is essential if you are going to keep from drifting, because you know what happens when you begin to neglect prayer, begin to neglect God's Word, you, you know, you hadn't been there a day, then it's been a week, and then it's been two weeks. Same thing happens with church. Before you know it, it's been a month, it's been a half a year, it's been a year. You just drifted. it. You didn't intend for it to happen, but that's what happened. Why? Because you didn't renew your faith on a daily basis. We have, if you live a normal lifespan, you have 20, about 25,000 mornings to greet every day of your life. Some of us have less than that. The good news is if you're a Christian in heaven, every day is morning. Okay, it's an eternal morning. But on this side, about 25,000 mornings. So on our journey home, every day presents an opportunity for a new beginning, for a new birth. New opportunities. So this is why you don't neglect your salvation. You just don't blare out pell-mell into your day without taking time to
to worship, to pray, to read your Bible, to ask God for guidance, to make a list even. What does God want me to do? I have a habit. I journal most every day of my life these days. I didn't do it all my life. I wish I had. But today and every day, my first conversation is with God. Our friend Bob Bodine has written a book called The Two Chairs. It's an outstanding book. And he actually uh, advises us to, to put a chair, an empty chair, by whatever chair you may sit in in the morning, your breakfast chair, your recliner. But set a chair there and in your mind put Jesus in that chair. Because when you dare to draw near, he dares to draw near to you. And in my mind, I can tell you, I invite the presence of Jesus into my life at the beginning of every day. And that sets my course. That sets me up for success in my day. I can tell you this, the days I neglect that practice, my days don't go as well. And that's, that's not just make-believe, it's true. The days that I don't begin it with God tend to to be sort of mindless and directionless. But if I will take the time to regularly bathe my soul in the presence of God, if I will open God's Word, if I will speak to Him, ask and pray. Listen to a couple of these scriptures. Uh, Psalm 5, 3. In the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay requests before you and wait in expectation. Psalm 90, 14. This is the prayer of Moses. Would you like to know what Moses prayed and how Moses was so great in his life? Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Again, the, make your first appointment of your day an appointment with God. It doesn't have to be long, but it can be a divine appointment. You hear his voice. You listen for his instruction. You seek his blessing. You renew your faith. You offer your life and repeat the next day. You say, well, that sounds like a lot. Well, do you want to drift or not drift? That's the question. How will you escape? How will you escape disaster in your life if you're drifting? Number three, quickly, invest in what matters. Give your life, your talent, your time, your treasures. Invest in what really matters. If you focus on selfish pursuits and sinful pursuits rather than spiritual pursuits, you will find yourself wasted. Invest in what matters. Invest in eternal things. Number four, fellowship with other believers, D-R-I-F, fellowship with other believers. This is why God has called us together as a family, as a church, because we get fired up together. When you put the logs together on the fire, it's a bigger fire. I need you, you need me. No wonder in Hebrews chapter 10, the writer will again say, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. But so much the more as you see the day approaching, the dark days, the tough days, so much the more. Encourage one another and exhort one another. So church, the family of God will keep you from drifting. I, don't, I can't tell you how many times in my life I've, I've seen it happen. An individual faithful in church, before you know it, they're missing a Sunday or two. They're doing other things. Got a vacation place, got a house by the lake, going to miss here, going to miss there. Before you know it, you're missing every Sunday. I've seen it so many times. It's just a casual drift. You didn't wake up one day and say, you know what, I'm never going to church again. You just started drifting. And as a result, you put yourself at risk in the high seas of life because you don't have the support of God's family. Finally, trust in God Trust God for your future. Trust God for your future. Live with hope. If you live for Jesus Christ, you're living in hope every single day. In fact, if you'll look, and we'll close with this in Hebrews chapter 6, 
There's a scripture that will help your soul to be anchored and steadfast in stormy seas. It's verse 19, chapter 6. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain, a sure and steadfast anchor for the soul. We need that, don't we? Something to steady us, to strengthen us, to keep us from drifting away, slipping away from our faith, from our family, from our commitments. It's an anchor for the soul. Did you know that one of the first symbols of the Christian faith was the anchor? You know about the cross. That was the early symbol of the church. You know perhaps about the fish, the ichthus became a symbol of the church because those original followers were fishermen, they were fishing for men, thus the fish, the ichthus. You may not know that one of the earliest symbols of the church was an anchor. If you visit the catacombs in Rome, you will see the symbol of the anchor on many of the tombs and grave sites. If you go to Jerusalem and walk into the empty tomb, the tomb that many think was the very tomb where Jesus was laid in the garden, Etched in the backside of that tomb is a cross and then the anchor below that cross. A cross that becomes an anchor. It comes right from that verse, hope which is an anchor for the soul. And in these dark days, in these stormy seas in which we are living in our lifetimes, we need an anchor for the soul. And that anchor is hope. And hope is not wishful thinking. Hope is the sure and steadfast confidence that what God says is true. The songwriter put it this way. In times like these, we need a Savior. In times like these, we need a what? An anchor. Some of you know this old song. Times like these, we need an anchor. Be very sure, be very sure that your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. That rock is Jesus. That rock is Jesus. Yes, he's the one, the only one. You want to keep from drifting in your life? then anchor your soul to the Lord Jesus Christ and never let go. Don't drift, but devote yourself to him.